no matter what we might face, it is, it is small in comparison with God. I'm going to ask you to turn to a couple passages with me this morning. Uh, the first one that we're going to look at is in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53, please. Isaiah chapter 53. And then if you would find and hold your place in John in the New Testament, John 18. So Isaiah 53 and John 18. While you're turning there, uh, in some introductory remarks, I'm going to make some comments about the nation of Israel. And uh, most of you are probably aware that uh, Israel is once again at war. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't see a statement like that without thinking of uh, wars that are coming and... Uh, the, just the times in which we live. Now, we're not, we don't need Israel to go to war for Jesus to come back. We're just looking for Jesus to come back. But we do know that that's a very uh, turbulent area, a very tumultuous area there in, in the Middle East. I don't, know, uh, I don't know all of the details behind uh, what's going on. Um, in this particular incident, the articles that I've read have said that uh, Hamas launched a surprise attack on a holy, uh, holy day, on a holy day um, in Israel, and uh, at least 22 dead, several hundreds injured, and that Israel is retaliating against that. Um, if that's the case, I stand with Israel. And... Um, but here's, what I, here's uh, also uh, what you need to be aware of. In the Bible, we're told to pray for the peace at Jerusalem. Now, you say uh, that really fits at a time like this, to pray for the peace at Jerusalem. You, you should probably go read what that's talking about and understand what exactly it is we're praying for. Because we're not just praying that this conflict would come to an end or all conflict in Israel would come to an end. We're actually praying for the event which will bring final peace to the nation of Israel, which is their Messiah, Jesus Christ, coming back again. And the reason that I even bring that up this morning is because we're going to read from Isaiah chapter 53... And this is a passage from the Hebrew Old Testament that a lot of Hebrew rabbis since the time of Christ have really not known what to do with. As a matter of fact, some rabbis have denied or forbidden their students even read this 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah um, because of the detail in this passage that just points in a particular direction that rabbis don't want to deal with and they don't want to explain. And here's one of the primary reasons for that. The, the Jewish people as a whole have denied Jesus as their Messiah. They, they do not believe that Jesus Christ, the man who came and lived on this earth uh, 2,000 years ago, is the promised one of old, the prophet that Moses said would come, uh, the one who uh, uh, followed the one who came in the spirit of Elijah and so many prophecies that were fulfilled in him, they just don't, they don't accept that Jesus was their Messiah. And so because of that, they are bound to have problems with the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. Read it with me, um, and I'll read out loud. You follow along there in your Bible. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men." a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely 
He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall... (coughs) Excuse me. Prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd bless your word this morning, and I pray that you'd speak to our hearts. God, we thank you for this prophecy of Isaiah. And Lord, as we take time to look at it this morning, in light of fulfilled prophecy and eternal truth, then God, I pray that you would have liberty to speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a couple things that this this prophecy entails, and one is that all are sinners. He talks about uh, ransom, uh, I'm sorry, uh, intercession being made for transgressors and the sins of many He's talking about generations of evildoers and the wicked. He talks about um, all of us who have uh, griefs and sorrows, which are the products of our own sinful choices and the sinful choices of others that are around us. The the basic truth of uh, our existence right now is to understand that there is a righteous, true, and holy God who is perfect, who is pure, who is just in all things. He made His creation to be in His image, but we have sinned against Him. We have fallen from our original state, our original condition, and now in sin, we are separated from God, separated from His holiness, separated from His righteousness, unable to get back on our own. That requires some intercession on our behalf. That requires somebody has to do something for us that we might be reconciled to a righteous God again. That we might be restored to fellowship with a holy God once again. And so God promised in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 that He would send the seed of a woman who would come and He would bruise the serpent's head And in the process, though, the serpent would bruise his heel. In other words, the serpent is going to hurt you. The serpent is going to inflict pain upon you. He is going to immobilize you temporarily. But in the process of doing so, you're going to crush his dominion. You're going to end his authority. You're going to end his reign and his rule. And so that prophecy gives way to Isaiah chapter 53 where we have more detail given about a coming Messiah that Isaiah, uh, who is uh, uh, hundreds of years before the time of Christ, is going to write and he's going to say, now listen, 
You need to be aware of this, that when the Messiah shows up, He's going to come in a dark day of Israel where not many people are going to be looking for Him. He's not going to... He's not going to show up in a day where everybody's eyes are toward the skies looking for the coming uh, promise of God, but He's going to come in the darkness uh, of, a, of a time where people are not looking. And sure enough, it was in the days of Roman persecution and oppression and, and uh, their, their tyranny that, that Jesus did show up. But he, the prophet also said, uh, in, in kind of a warning to the expectation of the people of Israel, you're, you're might, you might be expecting the Messiah to come in one way, but that's not how He's going to come. You're, you're expecting this King of Kings to show up and liberate you from your oppression. You're expecting uh, the, the coming in power and great glory that had been prophesied from time to time. Uh, you're going to be expecting someone to come and win your battles for you right away. But he said, you need to be aware that's not how it's going to look. Because when your Messiah shows up, he's actually going to grow up as a tender plant. In other words, he's not going to come as this king who is, who is already in his kingly garments and who is leading some angelic army behind him but He's literally going to grow up in front of you. He's going to grow up in your midst. Uh, he's going to grow up before Him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. Uh, a root sticking up out of dry ground only serves for one, comp uh, one, one purpose or accomplishes one thing, and that is a trip hazard. That's what a root out of dry ground does. Uh, it, it'll trip you up. Uh, a root out of dry ground isn't necessarily nourishing the tree, but if you're not watching, it'll reach down and grab your feet and throw you on the ground. And sure enough, Christ in His coming and in the way He came, He was a stumbling block. Not because God intended on people stumbling, but because the expectations of God's people was glory, not humility. They would be surprised to find out that he hath no form nor comeliness. In other words, he wasn't the, the beautiful king that they were expecting. He was a humble servant. And sure enough, that's exactly what the Bible says. There was nothing but comeliness in, uh, in regards to his coming. His birth was foretold to a, a virgin young lady who had never before known a man but who was a spouse to a carpenter named Joseph. They lived in Nazareth up in Galilee, and yet their house and lineage was from Bethlehem that the Scripture might be fulfilled. So when Caesar called for a taxation and a census to be done, they all had to travel down to Bethlehem, and they get down there just in time for Mary to deliver. Wow, what a coincidence. They show up in time just in the nick of time, to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. Because the Bible had already said, but thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the nations, out of thee, out of thee. And sure enough, that's where he was when he was born. There was no room in the inn, and so they were, they were uh, directed to a livestock enclosure, an animal stall. And that's where Jesus came into the world, wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger. His birth was not announced to the kings and the nobility, but angels showed up on a hillside to shepherds, the lowliest of professions and announced his birth and told them to go and tell the good news. No, I think it could be said of a truth that there was no form or comeliness that we should desire him. The Bible says, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. When, even when he performed miracles and people looked at him, they would not accept him as their Messiah because they said, is not this the carpenter's son? He's just a common person like you and I. There's, 
nothing special about him. There's nothing stand out about him. Oh no, not at all, other than deaf people being made to hear and blind people being made to see and lame people being made to walk. But it went, it went more than just his rejection. It went more than just the fact that he was, that he was uh, turned from because there was nothing desirable about him. That would have been one thing, but it went deeper than that because he was despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we know that this was the case on the night of his crucifixion, or the night before his crucifixion, as we're going to see in just a moment. But throughout his ministry, he was a man acquainted with grief, uh, acquainted uh, with uh, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And, And because of that, the Bible says, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. I want you to turn to John chapter 18 with me, if you would, please. And we're we're going to come back to Isaiah 53, so uh, be ready to do that. But in John chapter 18, the Bible says this in verse number 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kedron, where was a garden into the which he entered and his disciples. They go into the garden and Jesus goes away and he prays for a while until a mob shows up to take him under arrest. Jesus was betrayed by one of his own, Judas Iscariot. The Bible says in verse number 12, Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the place, uh, I'm sorry, the palace of the high priest. Verse number 19, the high priest then Asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. And in secret have I said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me. What I, what I have said unto them, behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but if well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest, and Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Are not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. And many of you know the story about Peter's denial. Verse number 8, Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. And it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him, and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again, and called Jesus, and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? 
And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I should release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. By the way, that means beat him. Many believe with a cat of nine tails, an awful implement of merciless torture. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man! When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith, Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They, dep they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he saith to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his, his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now this is one gospel account of this story. All, all four gospels bear record of this account. 
some giving details that other gospel records don't have. But one common thread throughout all gospel accounts of the arrest, the trial, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is the brutality that he suffered at the hands of sinful men. He was beaten. He was smitten. He was scourged. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us about the Messiah that his visage, that means his physical appearance, was scarred more than any man. He was barely recognizable as a man. And when he hung on that cross, he was a frail image of physical humanity. Cut, abused, bruised, bleeding. I, I believe naked. Every step was taken to bring shame, dishonor, reproach, and humiliation to our Lord. I want us to understand this morning the depths of that. The depths of the ugliness of what Jesus endured. I'm talking about the Son of God. The same person of the Trinity that spoke the worlds into creation. The same person of the Trinity that created man and formed him from the dust of the ground now became man and was mistreated by man more than any man ever has been. When they offered him something to ease the pain, to take the suffering, he refused it. Because he endured to the full extent every bit of the suffering that, was, that came to him at the hands of sinful man. Let me remind you that he deserved none of it. He himself was sinless. The Bible says in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. That's what you earn because of sin. But Jesus hadn't earned that. Jesus didn't deserve that. He was the sinless one, but He voluntarily took it. And in so many occasions that were offered to Him to take a way out, He chose not to take that way out, but to continue in that suffering. Why? Because this was the plan of God. This was the prophecy of God. This is what had to be accomplished. If sinful man was ever going to be reconciled to a holy God, then God Himself had to endure the pains of sin on man's behalf. It's because of this that Jesus not only endured the wrath of man, that's just what we could see. That's what the gospel writers wrote on account of by eyewitnesses. But what nobody could see was the wrath that Jesus endured from God the Father Himself. Taking man's wrath was ugly. But you and I cannot, we cannot imagine or fathom the wrath of an eternal righteous God who hates sin and chose to judge all sin in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. Yes, the, the, the beating is brutal, and yes, the bloodshed is agonizing, and I'm not doing anything, nor could I, to downplay or minimize the physical suffering that Jesus went through. But some of the most agonizing words that I believe Jesus uttered from the cross was not I thirst, and I cannot imagine with the loss of blood and the toil of what he went through, I can't imagine how thirsty he really was. But the most agonizing words I believe he uttered from the cross were in Aramaic, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
Martin Luther sat at a table meditating over that passage for more than 24 hours without taking food or drink. He just sat with his head face down to the table meditating over those words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it was written by one of Martin Luther's attendees or his servants later on that after sitting in that position for more than 24 hours meditating on that, he arose from his chair and said this aloud, God forsaken of God. Who can comprehend that? And that is the truth. I'm talking about God the Father and God the Son. One God, but manifested in two persons. A God who had never experienced a moment's disharmony for all of eternity past. And now God the Father was turning His back on His only begotten Son. You see, anything that you and I go through, we can go through with the hope that God knows and that God is in control and that God has a plan. But let me tell you something. What Jesus had to endure that day was God the Father turning His back upon Him and denying Him and forsaking Him because of the sin that He carried in His own body. And none of that sin was His. That was ours. That was my sinful choices and your sinful choices that He bore in His own body on that tree can't imagine the agony of that. But nonetheless, He endured it all. And the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53 tells us why. In verse number 4, Surely He hath borne our griefs. When that soldier hit Jesus with the palm of His hand, that wasn't meant for him. That was meant for me. That's what I deserve. The forsakenness by God, that shouldn't have been Jesus. That should have been me. I should be forsaken by God for all of eternity. I should have to die and go to hell. I should have to suffer in torment and agony forever and ever and ever because it was I who chose to sin against God. It was I who chose to be God's enemy. It was I who chose to go my own way. And all we like sheep have gone astray. But surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. I like this verse 5, but He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. In other words, the only reason that you and I can have peace with God is because Jesus has already taken all the penalty. He took the penalty so I could have peace. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him and with His stripes we are healed. God doesn't make me suffer for my sin. God made His Son suffer for my sin. He did that on my behalf. And it wasn't just something that God made Him do. It's something He did voluntarily. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my, my iniquity. By His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on Him 
Uh, congregation, listen, that's not fair. If we're just being honest about it, he did no wrong. That's not fair that, 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 the, that the, uh, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. But he didn't say this isn't fair. He said, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He didn't defend himself. He didn't try to get out of it. And believe me, he could have if he wanted to. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. It wasn't bad enough that they imprisoned him. It wasn't enough that they tried him wrongly. But they took him out of that prison. They took him out of that trial. And the end result was that he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. Some more prophecies. Verse 9, he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. No one could have foreseen a secret disciple by the name of Joseph of Arimathea who is a rich man who had a tomb wherein never a man had ever been laid. And that's who begs for the body of Jesus and that's who entombs him in a borrowed grave among the rich. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Church, would you understand this morning? This is the extent of God's love to us. The Bible says that God has no delight in the death of the wicked. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish. God is not a God who sits up in heaven waiting to zap and take out the wickedest of people. No, as a matter of fact, He hates to see the day of death for the wicked. He takes no pleasure in that whatsoever. He has no delight in that whatsoever. But it pleased the Lord to bruise His Son. Why? Because of His love for sinners. Because of His love for mankind. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise Him. He hath put Him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Do you realize that the only way that God can look at me and be satisfied is that he sees his son... If God looks at me and sees His Son, He's satisfied. He's satisfied by the travail of His soul. God has no desire that my soul suffer for all of eternity for my sin. Jesus has paid for my sin. Jesus has paid the price. He has made redemption possible. Reconciliation is available. And it is available to all who put their trust in Him. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Listen, when I think about Christ going to Calvary, when I think about what he suffered, when I think about what he endured, there's one thing that comes to mind, and that is this, all of that should have been mine. And I've got news for you. All of it should have been yours too. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And maybe you would say this morning, oh, I don't know, preacher, I'm not that bad of a person. This is not a matter of being good or bad. It's a matter of being a sinner. 
It's a matter of coming short of the mark. It's, it's a matter of God is righteous and we are not. And in our heart of hearts, we know we're not righteous. We know that we're sinners. We know that we've done things that have displeased God. Our conscience bears record to that. The Word of God bears rec record to that. We know that we are short of His glory, short of His righteousness. We know that we have sinned. It's not about a measurement. It's that we have fallen short of the measurement. Because of that, there's only one way back. And that's to put our confidence, our faith, our trust in the only one who ever lived and did measure up. And that same one who lived and measured up died when he didn't have to to pay the price of our sin to intercede for transgressors. And that's who we are. We are transgressors. And Jesus interceded on our behalf. Later this afternoon, our church membership will be meeting again at 5 o'clock. And it's to take the Lord's Supper. And yes, we do practice that with just our church membership. If you don't understand that, I'd, I'd love to talk with you at some time and tell you why we do that. I believe it's a biblical thing, but we do that, we do that among our church members. But when we come to that service, church members, we're not coming to share the glory. It's not the time for that. We're coming to remember what it cost. Our salvation is free to us, but that doesn't mean that a price wasn't paid. It's free to us. It's a free gift offered through Jesus Christ, God's Son. But it wasn't free. No, it had to be paid for. And the price that was paid was a high price. The life of Jesus Christ, His Son. The anguish of His soul. No, the fact is, I deserve to suffer for my sin. But I don't have to because my, son has been, my sin has been judged and paid for and what Christ accomplished in His going to the cross, in His death, and by His resurrection. And because I accepted that, you say, wait a minute, it's got to be more than that, preacher. Not according to the Word of God. Over 200 references in the New Testament alone of salvation by faith. By putting your trust in Him. You say, well, preacher, isn't repentance part of that too? Absolutely it is. Faith is a turning to Christ for salvation. You can't turn to something without turning away from something else. That's just the way turning works. And faith and repentance are the same thing. It's turning from what we thought to what we believe. It's turning from where we used to be to where we're going. Uh, it, it, is, it is repentance and faith together as one entity. And I'm going to tell you this morning that God is still saving sinners. God still forgives. His Son's death still covers all sin. To all who trust, to all that believe, to all that come to Him by faith. I don't know what your testimony is this morning. I can't see into your heart. I don't know if there's been a specific time in your life when you were convicted of your own sin and you knew you were a sinner and you called upon Jesus Christ saying, God, I believe that Jesus died to save me. I believe He rose from the grave. I believe He's a living Savior. And I trust in Him for forgiveness of sin and eternal life. And I'm telling you, if there's never been that time in your life, that time needs to be today. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed anything. We're, we're on borrowed time. 
Every breath we breathe is a gift from Almighty God and it is a testimony to His long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants to be your Savior. He wants to forgive you of your sin. He, he, wants, to, uh, he wants to give you the free gift of everlasting life and He wants to do that today. Remember, all sin brings suffering. And all sin deserves eternal suffering. But then you read the Word, and no wonder it's called the Gospel, which literally means the good news. Because the good news is this. I'm a sinner, and I deserve eternal torment but I don't have to worry about that because I've got a Savior who loved me so much. He went through all of that agony. He went through all of that suffering. He went through all of that and He did it for me so that when I put my trust in Him, He forgave me. He saved me. He reconciled me to God. And I don't look like yet what I will look like. But that's just because the work that He's begun in me isn't done yet. But one day it will be. And when it is, you'll get to see me for who I am. Perfect and righteous in Jesus Christ. I already have the position now. I just need the practicality of it. I'm telling you, I'm thankful for, I'm thankful for the Word that sanctifies Thankful for the Word of God that teaches me how He wants me to live and how, he should, how I should live and, and that His way is the right way and it really works. But listen, before we get into how we live, we've got to find out how to pass from death to life. And there's only one way to do that. And that is to accept the suffering of the Savior as being on your behalf. And by your faith, call upon Him and trust Him for forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. There's not been one who's ever come to Him that He's turned aside. There's never been anybody who's come to Him in simple childlike faith that He's ever said, no, not you. I didn't die for your sins. No, He died for the sins of the whole world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He's the satisfaction of the wrath of God, the propitiation for our sins and for the sins of the whole world. And He wants to be your Savior today. Heavenly Father, God, I thank You for Your Word. Thank You for the truth of the Gospel. Thank You for a Savior that has suffered on our behalf. And Lord, uh, I know we have guests in our service this morning. Lord, and my, my heart is with our guests today. God, my greatest desire for anybody who's visiting with us in our services today is that they leave here knowing that Jesus Christ has forgiven them of their sin and given them a new life reconciled to you as a true and living God. God, I pray that if there's somebody that doesn't know that today, that they would know that before they leave here this morning. God, I pray that if there's somebody who... Lord, you're speaking to their heart about making that decision that God, here in just a moment, you'd give them the courage to step out from where they are and come to this altar and let somebody take your word in which you cannot lie and show them how they can know for sure that Jesus is their Savior, heaven is their home, and sin is forgiven. God, it's also a special day for South Campbell Avenue Baptist Church and the members herein that Lord later this afternoon we plan to meet together to remember what Jesus did for us to remember the price that was paid the body that was so bruised and abused and the blood that was shed and God I pray that you would prick our hearts this morning to not take our forgiveness and the new life that we have in Christ, 
the peace, the joy, the abundance of that life. Lord, help us not to take it for granted. But God, would You call upon us this morning to remember the cost, the price that was paid. And God, may our hearts be eternally grateful for that. God, I pray Your blessing on this invitation now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me if you would, please? We're going to sing.